Father God, we thank you. We love you. We glorify you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. Is there a praise to know that we serve a good God and that come to bless him? Is there a praise to know we serve a good God? Come on, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. He's so worthy. He's so worthy.
say it. those hands together give God glory all over this place I want you to find somebody around you give them a big hug fist bump high five you know how we do it come on it's fellowship time come on You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. We're grateful and thank God for each one of you today. We thank God for our worship team. And of course, we welcome all of you watching around the world. Help me thank God for those watching around the world right now. We appreciate you. And you're watching at Mount Zion anywhere. If you're a first-time visitor, we want to welcome you and thank you so much for being a part of this worship experience. If it's your first time, if you don't mind, just stand there really quickly. We just want to thank God for your presence today. Come on, Mount Zion. Let's honor and thank God for our visitors. Please remain standing as our ushers are going to run to you quickly. They're going to give you a welcome packet and uh, just some information about our ministry. And we thank you so much. You could be a lot of places, but you chose to be with us tonight. And we appreciate you so very much. We're grateful to God. We thank you so much. Amen. One more time, Mount Zion. Let's thank God. Amen. Grateful also to have one of the most preachingest, anointed women on the planet with us. She's been following me, shadowing me all day today. She flew in and uh, uh, to spend the day with me. And she's a full gospel pastor uh, in St. Louis of the Worship Center. Her name is Pastor Maya White. I am so excited to have her here. She's a psalmist. She's a pastor. Come say hello to us. We're waiting for this service for you to greet us, but we thank God for. Let's thank God for her, y'all. She's a gift. Man, she's a gift from God, and I thank God. Amen. Amen for you on today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mount Zion, and thank you, Bishop. It's been an honor to be with Bishop today and for him to pour into my life. I want you to know that you have such a jewel in your presence that you are allowed to receive from daily, weekly. I think you should clap a little harder than that. Amen. When we honor the Lord for him, I just thank him for taking the time to pour into me. And um, he's instilled a lot into me today. And you, you'll see me again. So I just wanted to say thank you, Bishop. And thank you, Mount Zion. Thank you so much, Pastor. We appreciate you. Amen. What a gift. We also want, of course, as you know, our leadership is meeting tonight after this service. So right at 8.15, uh, after we shake hands and we clear out, we'll be right back here. All of our leaders will be sharing tonight. We encourage you to be a part of that. And also, uh, we're excited because we need Thanksgiving outreach volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering with us, uh, please make certain that you uh, connect with our ministry and uh, we want to make sure you you contact. Now there is a um, there is a uh, email address, and uh, so I, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, just flood my office and say, "What's the email address?" Let them know, Amen. So just flood the call. Just say, "Y'all didn't put the email address on the banner." So how are we gonna volunteer? Just flood them. Do them like that. Say, "Y'all just can't be putting up stuff, and no, we don't know how to contact you." So. Just reach over there and just tell them next time, put the email address up. Amen. So, amen. So, we need volunteers. Amen. And uh, so, call the church office and tell them, I want, what do I do? Amen. So, thank you for that. Also, um, our Thanksgiving Day service is going to be awesome. Let me tell you something. Uh, huh? They fixed me. Look at that. That's what you call the spirit of excellence. That's what you call, I want my job. I want my job. I love it. There you go. 
Amen. If you want to volunteer, there you go. Make sure you contact, amen, that, that email address. Amen. Thank y'all. <laughs> Listen, also, I do want you, uh, Thanksgiving service is going to be a blast. It's going to be awesome. Uh, every Thanksgiving, Mount Zion, we do it by virtual, by Periscope, and by Facebook Live. If you've not followed me on Periscope, make sure you download the app and uh, Joseph Walker 3. Follow me and also make certain you go on Facebook Live as well and uh, make certain that you do that. We really, really want you to be a part. 8 o'clock a.m. It's going to be a powerful service. You can do it from your house. We're going to ask you to be taking pictures and sending those out in, uh, in our social media media space, letting us know you and your family are watching. It's going to be a blessing. I got a word for you. It's our way of saying thank you. I know you can just turn the computer on and just say thank you, Jesus. can anybody do that? I mean, that's just the, the least we can do, right? Also, we're excited about 1866. Of course, as you know, we are uh, literally four weeks away, and we are believing God. And I know some of you are trusting God and believing God. People have been so kind, and people walked up to me today saying, Bishop, I'm paying on my 1866, paying it off, doing this. Too. I just appreciate every single person that is giving toward this campaign. $2.3 million left, four weeks left, and we got a God who has, who has every, every, everything in his hands. So I'm trusting him. And I also trust in him that God would lay it upon the hearts of others to be generous and to help us to close this gap. So why don't you do that? Uh, if you want information about it, if you want to make a pledge, you can do that tonight. Get a pledge card or just go on there, pay a pledge on your envelope, put all in. We appreciate you so much. To that end, it's offering time. We're the blessed people of God in the house tonight. Where are you? Yes, 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 yes. So let's prepare our hearts to give liberally tonight. God is so faithful. He's so good to us. And uh, the liberal soul shall be made fat, so says the Lord. And so tonight, let's do that. And of course, if you're giving around the world virtually, you know how to do it. We thank you so much for your generosity as well. We're going to pray. We're going to be ready to get right into this word on tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to give. Bless every household, every family. We speak covenant blessings now upon them. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. your word will speak life to us our faith be strengthened and we give your name the glory and praise in jesus name amen all right we're going to start this series tonight and of course we'll pick up part two after the week of thanksgiving of course there'll be no bible study next week so please keep in mind this part two will happen after the week of thanksgiving but today we're going to start this series and i'm trying to get some defeat over doubt and discouragement and our anchor scripture tonight as we deal with this issue of doubt is in uh, Psalm 42. Psalm 42 and verse 11 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of my countenance and my God. There's some things in life that cause us to question what we believe. It can be based on times in the past where you've had experienced failure, can be discouraging words from other people who don't believe in your dream or your vision. And whenever you begin to be down or disheartened, discouraged, concerning the things you're hoping for, you have to recognize that what has creeped in 
is a spirit of doubt. It comes into your mind and gets into your spirit. And while it isn't necessarily a thing to be celebrated, doubt is truly a part of the human condition. So much so that the Bible contains some portraits for us to examine on how doubt manifests in the life of people who did extraordinary things. For instance, there was a story about Gideon. We all know Gideon's story about how God downsized him to get a victory, but few of us know how Gideon tested God. He shies away from his call, right? Because Gideon begins to doubt that God could actually use one man, him, to turn the tide against Israel's oppressors. So he tests God twice. He gives God a challenge. Go figure that. To prove God's reliability through a series of miracles. And then he would believe. Judges 6, chapter 36, chapter 6, verses 36 to 40 records the story. Watch it. Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. I'm going to put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I'll know that you're going to help me rescue Israel as promised. Hmm. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, okay, God, please don't be angry at me, but let me make one more request. Who that sound like? You. <laughs> Watch this. Let me use the fleece now. And for one more test, this time, let the fleece remain dry while the crown around it Gets wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked, and the fleece was dry in the morning, and the ground around it was covered with dew. God removed Gideon's doubt by using him to lead the Israelites to victory. And the question I want to raise tonight is the question I want you to ask somebody sitting next to you. Just look at them and say, how much more God got to do? I mean, how, how, much, how much more? Like what, what, what else do you need God to do? Because every time he does one thing, you're like, okay, God, one more, one more thing. I, I, know, I, know, I know what you did then, but just, Lord, Lord one, 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 more, one more thing, we'll be good. You see, people of God, listen, that's another story. Sarah. Sarah doubted, caused her to laugh at God's promise. Now, you know the story here, Abraham, his wife Sarah, now they were believing God. God spoke to them and said, you're going to get pregnant. What makes this interesting is that Sarah laughs at the prospect that they would birth a son in their old age. Sarah is 89 and Abraham is 99. Genesis 18 verses 10 through 15 says, then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year. And your wife, Abraham, basically Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to the conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also old? She didn't throw him under the bus. <laughs> but what Sarah and Abraham is going to discover is that if you got vision, you don't need Viagra. I'll get that one. I'll get that tomorrow. <laughs> Here's the reality. Watch it. And the Lord said to Abraham, why does Sarah laugh? Why does she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? God says, I'm going to return this time next year. Sarah going to have a son. Sarah was afraid. She denied it. Right to God. God says, did, 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 did you laugh? No, no, I didn't. I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. Just like many of us, we may not audibly laugh, but in our spirit, doubt makes us 
You ever had that moment, right? Because think about it. When you juxtapose your current situation over against what God is saying is going to happen, you begin to look at life logically and practically and begin to say, yeah, uh -huh, right. <clears throat> me? That's going to happen to me? And that laughter is rooted in doubt. Like there are people today who have great faith. I know you stand out. Bishop, we believe it's going to happen. 1866, we got four weeks left, $2.3 million. Some of y'all seem like, <laughs> ooh, right. Because there's doubt. Let me help you understand how to get past that. See, Biblical scholars state that on earth doubt was conceived and given birth in the garden when the serpent cast doubt on God's character and God's goodness. Genesis 3. Tragically, Adam and Eve both brought into the deceptive plan plunge humankind into the fall. In both instances, doubt clearly was an aspect of sin. It is directed toward God and characterized by rebellion and disobedience. Wherever there is doubt, you are questioning the very nature and character and ability of God. Wherever there is doubt, you're questioning the character, the nature, the ability of God. See, doubt may have entered in through disobedience in the garden, but it can be overcome by faith and parted to us through the resurrection of Christ. And in order for us to overcome doubt, you have to understand what doubt is. Let's see, what is doubt? Doubt is to call a thing into question, to call a truth into question, to be uncertain, to doubt about it. See, doubt in Scripture can be seen to be a characteristic of both believers and unbelievers. You don't have to be an unbeliever to have doubt. There are people who are believers who yet doubt. Mm -hmm. I'm sure do you. In believers, it is usually a weakness of faith, wavering in the face of God's promises. In an unbeliever, doubt is virtually synonymous with unbelief. So scripture, as would be expected, does not look at doubt the way you think it does. It literally looks at doubt for what it is. Not philosophically, epistemologically. But that word epistemologically just deals with the investigation of what distinguishes a justified belief from an opinion. That's an 18th century word. But doubt is viewed practically and spiritually as it relates to our trust in the Lord. Meaning that for the reason doubt is not deemed as valuable or commendable. Which means that there has to be a delineation between doubt and unbelief. Let's look at that for a second. What's the difference between doubt and unbelief? Does doubt make me a non-believer? Well, being a believer in Jesus Christ does not mean that your life will be absent of moments of doubt. There are witnesses in this place that will tell you they, they believe in Jesus Christ, but they've had some doubt. Have you ever had doubt? Have you, can you be honest about it? I've, I do believe in Jesus Christ, but I, every moment I doubt it, right? See, the Jewish believers who opposed Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 26, were complete unbelievers. But the man in Mark chapter 9, verse 24, who took his son to Jesus because the disciples could not heal him, and he said, Jesus, I brought my son to you. He gnashes and teeth foams at the mouth. He goes from the heat to the water. He's got a demon. Jesus, can you help him? Jesus said to him, do you believe? <laughs> and the father said in verse 24, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm a believer, <laughs> but help my unbelief. See how doubt creeps in? You see, it was not, he was not a full unbeliever. He was just... A doubter. Peter was a believer, yet gives us a picture of doubt when he walks on the water with Jesus and then begins to sink. Jesus says to him in Matthew 4, 31, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So he began to sink. Doubt is not the complete absence of faith. It is faith laden with weights of unbelief which threatens to sink us. Doubt serves no purpose in your life at all. So as you assess the effects of doubt in your life, you've got to take the necessary steps to overcome it. To rid yourself of the doubt and the people who carry doubt, because the people who carry doubt are people who carry the doubt virus. <laughs> I'm going to help you understand this. It's contagious. Hang around doubtful people long enough and you'll start doubt. Okay, okay, watch this. 
There are characteristics of doubters. There are several. There are four. Number one, doubters are uncertain about decisions. Doubters are always uncertain. They're always out there like, uh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Because they're, 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 it doesn't mean they don't think that they're just always uncertain. They never can really strike. They're always just, uh, uh, uh. Those are the folks you hate taking the like Piccadilly or going through the line and you got to, may I help you please? Uh, line be bright. Uh, take it to, what you want on your sandwich? Uh, you can figure it out before you got here. <laughs> Doubters are distrustful. Doubters distrust everything. They distrust even authentic moves of God. A doubt is distrustful of things that could be happening around them that are sincere and honest and true and you can have an awesome service and people come in like, you know, man, we really enjoyed this service. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I did, but uh, mm, <laughs> just something. I don't know. What was it? I don't know. Just something. Just, just doubter, man. Like you just can't believe the move of God, right? You see a miracle in front of you? I don't know. I mean, you saw it in your inf- I don't really know. Right? Doubters tend to call logic, call on logic and reason. They're Stoics. According to the scripture, Paul goes to Mars Hill and encounters the Stoics and the Epicureans. Epicureanism are those who live by passion, by feeling, emotion. Stoics are those who live by reason and rationale and logic. And so consequently, if you live your life by logic, the logical thought processes oftentimes conflict with faith, which causes your doubt to emerge. Um, people who think like this, sometimes it's hard to turn it off. Right, like Dr. Steph and I is kind of we're, we're a case study on this, right? She's, she, her, you know, she's a, I got, you know, she, I got a BA degree, she got a BS degree, right? So she's science, I'm, I'm liberal arts. So liberal arts people, we think in gray areas, we think in, you know, abstract, we creatives, we, you know, we things don't always make sense to us, but we could just kind of make something out of, you know. But people, you know, in the science, it's a very abstract majority, like you know, it is what it is, it is this or that, it's this or that. So it's hard to turn that off. Right? Because when you're in science, you just, it's this or that. It's this or that. When you're in, in, in the law, it's just like, well, there's, you know, there's this space out here. <laughs> so what happens is when you can't turn this or that off, you bring that logic into, watch this, into the activity of God. I'm getting ready to bless you now. So you're the kind of people who are logical that would have sent 4,000 905 people away when Jesus had two fish, five loaves of bread. Ain't but five sandwiches coming out this, y'all. So I'm going to all y'all take your children and go home because this ain't logical. Somebody not going to eat. 4,995 people are going home if you in charge of passing that fish sandwiches. <laughs> if you at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's in hot pursuit and there's nowhere to go and Moses is on his knees praying, asking God, what shall I do? You'd have been the one saying, we're going back to Egypt. <laughs> Ain't nobody going to die here because you view everything logical. One of the most fascinating things about the Word of God, I'm going to drop something on you really quickly. Think about this for a second. If you think about reason and logic, the Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I said that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God, right? So if you could ever transform your mind, even if you do think in logic and reason, and transform your mind to read the Word and hear the Word as logic, but not your logic, The word logos is the word word. And the word logos is where we get the word logic, which means that God's word is God's logic, which means God's logic don't always make sense to your logic. (laughs) That's why sometimes it ain't logical when you sit there talking about, I can't afford the tithe. God's like, ha, 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 that's your logic. But I guarantee if you give it, turn it over to me. You always have more than they pay you. Because see, God's logic makes your blessing illogical 
to people who try to interpret it. Somebody should have took a lap right there, but we're in Bible study. Doubters also, watch this, hesitate before acting. Doubters just, they hesitate. They don't, they just, they just hesitate. They don't, they don't move instinctively. They just, they just wait and wait. They just don't, right? It's like, I want to come. I want to come. I, I thought it fascinating. You know, Peter steps off the boat and walks on the water. I'm always fascinated about who's behind Peter. Who was the next person? Look at that Peter like, he getting out. I'm going, but hold on, hold on. I'm going to see how this is going to play out. <laughs> it may not be written in the scripture, but I'm sure. Well, if another reporter had seen that, they probably thought he was on the boat like, I'm going, oh no, let me see how this is going to play out. Because you doubt whether or not it can actually happen. In the gospel, the word doubt consistently carries a negative connotation, as you can see, right? And the object of doubt is always the Lord. It's always to cause you to have, you know, a lack of belief in God. And doubt, Peter doubted Jesus' ability to keep him from drowning. And uh, Peter became doubtful, the Lord's reliability and the power to sustain him. The Pharisees doubted Christ's messiahship. And what is interesting is that the Bible even says that if we have faith in God and do not doubt, according to Matthew 21, 21, that we can actually move mountains <laughs> if we do not doubt. We can, move mount we can move walls if we do not doubt. Here's the deal, though. The doubt is the antithesis of faith. It's, 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 it's interesting. Jesus says in John 14 and 1, let not your heart be troubled when he's getting ready to get out of here. He's really saying, don't doubt what I'm telling you. The reason why your heart is hurting is because you, you doubt. If you doubt who I am and who I was in your life, you're going to be grieving. You're going you're gonna to miss this moment. And because some of them did, it's why during the resurrection, Jesus comes and after the resurrection, it is Thomas who says, I won't believe unless I see the handprint, the nail print in his hand because he's doubting Thomas. You see, people of God, how does doubt affect you as a believer? Well, I'm glad you asked. The book of James says something very powerful to us. In James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, it says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's devil-minded and unstable in all of his ways. See, wherever there is doubt in your life, there is, there is no stability. Where there is no stability, there is vulnerability and gullibility. Any way will pull you away because you're, so, you're such a doubter, it doesn't take much to move you in, because you don't really believe in nothing. You just kind of can easily be swayed and move and if you're unstable like that, you always end up coming short of your goal. Because doubt causes you to fall short. Paul was saying, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I pressed toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing toward something. I'm I'm not going to be distracted by past issues and past things. I'm literally pushing and pressing toward what God promised me. And if you're seeking God for elevation or breakthrough to come in your life, you got to follow the plan of God and not lose focus. And the way to accomplish that, you got to overcome doubt. Let me, let me get very practical with you just for a moment on how to overcome it. You got to learn to trust God, man. Do you trust, do you really trust God? There are moments in my life when, 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 when I feel doubt coming in and I go to praying to God and all God's response is to me is, do you trust me? I'm like, sure God, I trust you. Then why are you praying? <laughs> now that, that messed some of y'all up. I'm just throwing this revelation out because this is what God gave me for you. You ever thought about something? Watch this. Classic example. Jesus gets on a ship. First of all, Jesus tells the disciples, let us pass over to the other side. Jesus gets a pillow, gets on the ship first, goes to the back, and goes to sleep. The disciples are on board. We going, he said we were going to the other side. Are y'all with me now? Watch what happened. This is going to bless you. When the storm comes, 
The disciples panic. What do they do? Go wake up Jesus. Who's doing what? It's almost like Jesus back there in REM sleep and wakes up like, what? They ask him, do you care that we are going to perish? Now what you forget about that story because we always go right to it, Jesus said, peace be still. The real revelation is not peace be still. The real revelation is this. Do you care that we going to perish? What you should be hearing is let us pass over to the other side. If Jesus has said us going over, then why are you letting what happens in between cause you to doubt what I said? Listen, people of God, Zorin Kierkegaard says, every mental act is composed of doubt and belief. But it is belief that is positive. It is belief that sustains thought and holds the world together. See that? Watch this. Here are the five ways to overcome doubt. You gotta have faith. You gotta have faith. You need to have faith in God and in yourself. You need to believe that God has equipped you with every good work. See, the fact is, you got to just believe what God told you. You got to believe by faith. That's what the Bible says, now faith. You, got, you, you, you really got to believe. Listen, your faith has to be so active and so real right now that you got to believe what God's word told you. And you got to believe in yourself. You, you, you are doubting Yourself. You got faith. The real issue, everybody got calls. Doubt shows up. God called Moses. I got, I got speech, speech problem. <laughs> God called Jeremiah. I'm too young. God called you to do something. How am I that God? You know I, what I'm working with. <laughs> God like, listen, I knew everything about you when I called you. I knew every single thing about you when I called you. So why are we having this conversation? See, the fact of the matter is, people of God, you're doubting yourself. So your, your, your doubt, here, here, here's the real issue. The issue really is not with your capacity. The issue is you not trusting God's ability. Because what you're doing is saying what you can't do. Last time I checked, you could do all things through who strengthen you. Number two, stop worrying about what other people think. The reason why you're doubting because you're worried about the crowd response rather than consecrating your connection with Christ. You know you're doubting because what happens every time you do something, you want to ask somebody, how did I do? Because you feed yourself off of the opinions of the crowd. How did I do? So you go ask your good friends, two or three people, how did I do? They tell you, you did great. That ain't enough for you. You got to go ask 18 more people, how did I do? I'm going to be tired of telling you how you did. You worry about what other people think. Get where I'm going? See, people like that, you're the kind of person that's so consumed with the opinions of people, you have nervous breakdowns when people unfollow you on social media. <laughs> Number three, move from contemplation to action. You're taking too much time overthinking the situation. The doubt, the opposite of doubt is faith. Your faith operates now. See, you got to move from contemplate. You got to stop thinking about it and talking about it and just start doing it. See, because you can't, watch this, this is going to bless you. You can't be afraid of failure. You'll never know if you, if, 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 if you will never know if you have the ability to be successful into something to you until you've tried it. Because there's no failure in God. And if you were created in the image and likeness of God, you were not designed to fail. God needs you to stop being fixated on failure and start winning. See, I play basketball. People here that play basketball me know I got a pretty good game. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it's just facts. I always try to give you the truth from the pulpit. 
The only reason why I'm not with the Lakers today is because I'm here with y'all. See how much I love y'all? Man, y'all should be thankful. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Let me tell you something though. But those who play ball with me know I shoot. That's what I do. Don't get it twisted. I shoot. That's what I do. And every time I shoot, I believe I'm going to make it. That's why my percentages are high when I shoot. You give me 10 shots, 7 out of 10 going in. Because I believe when I shoot. People that play with me be like, bro, hold him. Because he never saw a shot he didn't like. This going to bless some of you in a minute. Sometimes I go to the free throw line. I take too long. And I think about it. And doubt creeps in. And I don't follow through. And, I, and it comes up hitting the rim. I'm like, man, I missed that free throw. The only reason I missed it because I held the ball too long. Because I'm a shooter. Because what I do when I get the ball, let's go. I shoot. What's the lesson for you? Take your shot. That's a whole nother sermon for some of y'all. <laughs> That's a whole nother revelation. Touch your neighbor and say, shoot your shot. Shoot your shot. <laughs> Stop wasting time investing in doubt. Any amount of time you spend in doubt, it's time you could have invested towards something that would yield your return. You got to stop wasting time investing in doubt, putting all your energy toward doubt because what you do is you train your spirit and your mind and your mouth to speak doubt. So you oftentimes ask questions in the negative, assuming the bad answer. So you shoot your shot. You don't want to call me, do you? <laughs> Y'all ain't going to need, do you? Y'all not hiring, are you? Because you just so, you train your spirit to always think it ain't going to happen. The longer you carry doubt, the weight, the stronger the power becomes over your life. And therefore, you cannot become tempted to think that carrying that weight is normal. Good news is that you have to combat doubt by re-realizing truth. Re-realize truth. Yeah, I said it. Re-realize truth. You know it, but you got to re-realize it. Because after tolerating lingering doubt, you got to do in the words of prophetess Elsa, let it go. <laughs> and obey. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall do what? Make straight your path. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Right? Lean not to your own understanding because you're so, you're so cerebral. You try to logically process life and reality and that's where doubt comes in. At some point, you've got to trust God to this point. Do you trust him? See, so immerse yourself in truth. The gospel according to John 20 and 21, 31, these are written so that you may believe Jesus is Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have faith in his name. Author Robert Kowalski declares, Face your fears and doubts, and new worlds will open up to you. See, when you face fears and doubts, there's no limit on what you can accomplish. Abraham is a positive example of faith and conquering doubt. Why? Because we see Abraham progressively move. We get to Genesis chapter 12. It's a powerful thing, right? Because Abraham has to get up and leave his country, his mother. God, God, God establishes covenant with Abraham early on. Leave your father and mother. Go to a land that I will tell you. And Romans 4, 20 speaks to that, that Abraham did not waver. He did not doubt. And it strengthened his faith because he believed without wavering and doubting. Can you believe without wavering? Stop worrying and stand on God's word. See, the way to get through this, people of God, is come to a place where you get beyond the what ifs. You can't keep living your life by what if. What if? I would do it, but what if? What if? People come to me all the time with that. My oh, bishop, what if it don't work? What? What? What if this is? What, what, listen, man, let me tell you something. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, in him are amen to the glory of God through us. 
which means that everything God promised has a yes attached to it. Oh my God, I like that right there. You see, people are going to stop doubting what God said he was going to do in your life. There's no room for doubt in the places that God is about to take you. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the God of peace. Well, I says he'll guard your hearts through Jesus Christ. This is so important. It passes all understanding and guard your hearts. I, I love this, right? Because doubt dilutes the promise of God towards your life. The reason why you're anxious and worried because you doubt. The reason why you're not sleeping because you doubt. You, you, you doubt. And I'm going to show you how this works because in Proverbs 12 and 25, anxiety weighs down the heart. But a kind word does what? I want to I want to I want to bless you with some real quick. You know, you don't realize, people of God, how faith itself is your greatest weapon toward doubt. Let me show it to you. Can I can I can I break this down? We're gonna be done. Let me show you some. I want you to process some for a moment. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven and one. Just just let me let me just let me just talk to you. Can we just have a conversation? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Let me perform surgery on that text. Let me exegete that text. Let me break that text down in a way that you probably never thought about it before and put it in context to faith and doubt. Okay? You're going to help me with this. It's going to be an exercise. This is going to be a real Bible study. Are you ready? The first two words of Hebrews 11 and 1 are what? Now faith. Everybody shout now faith. Now. Shout it again. Say now faith. now faith. Now watch this. The word now deals with continuity, present, current, immediacy, imminence, right now. Got it? Faith, according to Romans, declares comes by hearing. Hearing by the what? So faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the what? The word of God is a revelation. The word of God is not just a historical Bible book. The word of God is a living word, a revelation constantly being spoken in your life. God's word is revelatory. It's not like static. It's not like it's a history and date. It is a revelatory word that speaks in your life. There can be no relevance if there is not revelation. The revelation makes it relevant to your situation. Are you hearing me? So if the word of God is your revelation, revelation becomes your foundation. So, now... The revelation is my foundation. So, when doubt comes in now, immediately the revelation, which is my foundation, counters the doubt. I don't have to wait until Sunday or Wednesday to come get a word. I'm in so much doubt. I need a word from God. No, because I have a living word inside of me that the moment doubt creeps in, the reason why I'm able to cast down imaginations and every high thing and bring it into captivity under the knowledge of Jesus Christ is because my revelation is right now. So when doubt creeps in, immediately the revelation which is my foundation counters it so when doubt says you will not be healed the revelation says oh but by his stripes when doubt says the bill won't get paid the revelation says but my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory because there is an immediacy the moment revelation counters doubt you're moving toward it wait a minute Watch what happens. So now, faith. Watch this. We're performing surgery on that verse. Now faith is. 
Now, the revelation that I'm standing on. So I'm not waiting to be healed. I is. I know that ain't linked. I know. I know. I know. See, you is kind. <laughs> you is important. Y'all not getting this. What she was really saying is that when you lay hold to this revelation, whatever people spoke of your life, you will never doubt the greatness on your life because the revelation on the foundation changes your situation. Boy, I wish I could help somebody get this. That's what she was really saying to Mo Mabley. She was saying it to Mae Mobley because you, you is kind, you is special, you is important because you doubting yourself. Don't ever doubt yourself because your revelation changes your situation. Now watch this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the stuff that makes me hope. What am I hoping for? That's something, that's an end game. I'm hoping to graduate. I'm hoping for employment. I'm hoping to be debt free. I'm hoping to be healed. That's, I'm hope, so what's the stuff? What fuels it? What fuels it is the revelation. My foundation causes me to hope. <laughs> See, when the devil is attacking you, he's after your hope. The only reason why somebody puts a needle in their arm raises their wrists or jumps off a bridge it's because they've lost they start doubting the revelation and they created another foundation but that's why we declare on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground is sinking sand because remember where there is doubt there is no stability. There is no foundation. But when I have the word of God as my foundation, it keeps reminding me who I am. Yes, I am the head and not the tail. I'm blessed going in and blessed coming out. Oh, I shall live and not die. In the words, I, can't, I can't escape it. Now, wait a minute. This way it gets really interesting. It is also the evidence of things not seen. What you say? What you say, Bishop? It's the evidence things not seen. Amen. My whole life I've been trained to respond to what I see. <laughs> Your whole life you've been trained to respond to what you see. And the enemy knows it. <laughs> That's why the enemy tries to show you things that cause discouragement, yes, that lead to disillusionment, yes. that lead to the psalmist saying, why is my soul disquieted within me? Because I see so much that causes me to lose hope yes, and start doubting. Yes, hmm. Yes, but when I get a revelation, I begin to realize that this revelation I'm walking in, I don't walk in by sight. Because this word I'm standing on, this word I stand on, I walk by faith and not by sight. That everything that exists was made by things which do not appear. Which means I am living in another realm. I don't look at things like other people look at things. Well, the way I look at life, I expect a miracle. I see the invisible. Feel the intangible. Oh my God. Because see, where there is no revelation, there is no expectation. But I got two or three folk out there that can declare I'm expecting something. I may not see it right now, but I'm expecting something to happen. Watch it. So you may not even realize it, but I want to be in your head this week. I want to be in your head this week. I want you to always remember this. An act of faith and an act of conquering doubt. You're going to go to the gas station. Yep. You're going to drive up. 
because you need gas. You're going to pull out your debit card and slide it into a machine. And you're going to put all your personal information by faith into a machine. And you're going to believe by faith after having done that that what's in that gas pump is going to go in your car. You never see the gas. All you do is hear. But you never. Y'all not getting it. You don't. You don't. You don't. You really don't see it. You just. Boom, boom, boom. And you're going to take it out. Get back in your car. And you're going to drive all around town. Assuming you got a full tank of gas. Because of one little indicator. That says full. You ain't seen the gas. All you got is an indicator that says full. The only reason why God brings you to a place like this because you may not see the miracle right now but God will have somebody by you who can say I'm an indicator. I'm evidence of what you can't see because if you can see it on my life you know God going to do it on your life. You may not ever see the wind but the leaves out there testify that the wind is right there. Somebody ought to be a lead tonight to say I'm testifying. And so I saw something. I close with this. I saw something, Barry, that messed me up. My theologians, my, my seminarians, I told them to grab hold of this. Because we, we see Peter walking on the water. Isn't that a wonderful story? Peter walking on the water. That's great. I love it. He got the boat. But have you ever thought about this? Listen to me. Hmm. That maybe Peter never saw Jesus. Pause for a second. Think about it. Maybe he never saw him at first. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because when the disciples were out there and it was foggy, the Bible said they thought they saw a ghost. Yes. Yes. And Peter said, if it be you, bid me come. Jesus says, it is I, come. Which meant Peter didn't step out on what he saw. He stepped out on what he... I, I need somebody tonight to understand that's really how you defeat doubt. That I'm stepping out here on a revelation and I believe today if you step out on a revelation, I believe that God will give you every desire of your heart. Reach over and tell somebody, step out on it. Whatever God told you, step out on the revelation of God. Lift your hands all over this place. I come against every spirit of doubt. I come against every spirit that tried to rob you of God's promises over your life. I declare right now that everything that is held up, every promise in your life shall be cast down. Every spirit of doubt and unbelief shall leave your life. That your faith shall come to a level that's so profound and strong that you don't have to see it, but you will step out and believe it. I declare that now those of you that have doubted and laughed in your spirit about what God was going to do because you have put your situations above God's power, but now you will know that if God has said it, that there is a yes behind what God has declared over your life. And I declare the decree tonight that everything you will stand in faith without doubt believing that it shall manifest now. I believe that now you're about to turn a significant corner in your life because of your doubt is gone and your faith is strong. And so we believe it's already done. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I need somebody to give him a victory shout declaring it's already done. Tonight, 
somebody here tonight this revelation has got to be your foundation it's real simple if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ if you're here tonight you're straight away not where God wants you to be need a church home don't sit out there in doubt come on be where God wants you to be I'm going to give you these 60 seconds to make this move because there's no hesitancy in God you just got to trust him I want you to move this way right now I want you to declare that today I want to be where God wants me to be I want to experience everything God has I want the fullness of God's power in my life I need everything God has in my life right now I want you to meet me right now I'm talking to you right now come on come on come on to do just what just what he said he would come on God bless you come on church every come on come on come on no doubt no doubt come on place thank God for you I welcome you today thank God for your responding to God's word our team's going to take you just follow this gentleman right here they're going to share with you come on church let's thank God today God is amazing I pray you will bless listen I want you to make sure you make it here this weekend Saturday or Sunday it's going to be amazing we just cannot wait next week don't forget we'll be announcing it this weekend as well uh, there won't be any Bible study next week we'll all gather by virtual space on Thursday morning and we'll pick this series back up on the following Wednesday so I thank God for you I'll be outside shaking hands leaders are going to hang out in here we'll start right at 815 may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face shine upon you may you walk in power faith with no doubt. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We leave this place and never your presence. In Jesus' name, somebody say, Amen.